It's almost the finish line. Just a little more. Come on, Bolt. We can make it. Yes, yes, we've done it again. So, as you can see, the winner was me, Matilda, along with my horse, the Heroic Bolt. This is our third win in a row already. Woohoo! It may only be a small hometown race with a modest prize, but it's still gonna go a long way in supporting my grandparents' farm. Now it's time for this guy to rest. Good boy, Bolt. You did amazing out there. A 16-hand stallion, healthy, glossy coat, and a well-mannered temperament. Jeez, the horse dealers even follow me home now? I took a handful of hay, spun around, and hurled it at him. Go away. I don't want your stinking money. Bolt is not for sale. Right at that moment, my grandpa appeared. Matilda, that is no way to speak to our guest of honor. I apologize for my granddaughter's behavior. She's a firecracker at times. Teenagers, you know? Anyway, it's dinner time. Please join us for a home-cooked meal right this way. Huh? Guest of honor? Who could he be? Oh my god. It turns out the man was none other than Mr. Allen, the chairman of All Stellar Inc. Corp., the annual sponsor of my family's farm. I turned beet red and apologized profusely for being so rude to him. No problem, kiddo. I like your spirit. I thought it'd be a good idea to check out the farm I'm sponsoring, and I stumbled upon the racing tournament. Oh boy, you sure can race, can't you, girl? Not many can handle a wet track at that speed. We have our reservations about her skipping school and competing in such dangerous races. But Matilda's insistent that she was a part of this family, so it's her responsibility to help us, her only remaining relatives. Mr. Allen gave me this thoughtful look, then said, How about this? The annual sponsorship for your grandparents' farm stays the same, and on top of that, you can move in with me and have a proper education. Did I hear him right? I gasped. B but who will take care of my grandparents? Sweetie, we still have our health. We can run this place just fine. That's right, Maddie. Take your chance. Opportunities like this don't come twice. But what about Bolt? I can't go without him. Bring him along. I have a small horse farm where he can stay. You can help around the stables, and we can call it payment for your school fees, alright? Well, I guess that's settled then. Yay! One week later, Mr. Allen sent his driver to pick me up, and the new chapter of my life started from here. Wait, oh my god, this can't be it. Mr. Allen said it was a small horse farm, but this place, it's enormous. As soon as I stepped out of the car, a girl my age rushed over and hugged me. Matilda, you're finally here. I'm your new sister, Judy. I greeted her back with the widest smile. She seemed so sweet. She led me over to the front porch where Mr. Allen and a woman were waiting for me. It must be my new mom, but why was she giving me such a strange look? Before I could even introduce myself, she turned and walked into the house. Hmm, maybe she wasn't feeling very well? That evening, I dined on a lavish meal. We chatted lots and the Allens seemed fascinated by my childhood life at the farm. Especially Judy with her 10,000 questions. <laughs> Sis, so, um, is it true that you have never seen your parents? Yeah. My father passed away in an accident before I was born, and my mom also left me when I was an infant. On hearing that, Judy gently comforted me while Mr. Allen smiled and said, Now, besides your grandparents, you also have us, your second family. You got a sister, a new dad here, and also your caring mom. Right, darling? Mrs. Allen flinched and dropped her fork. I immediately leaned over to ask, Mom, are you okay? But to my surprise, she just yelled at me. Don't call me that. Feeling flustered, I stared down at my plate. Had I done something wrong? Over the following days, I tried my best to get closer to mom, but I was always met with coldness in return. One time, seeing Mrs. Allen was resting outside, I brought her an iced coffee. But as soon as she saw me coming over, she placed her hat over her face pretending to be asleep. On another occasion, I complimented her dress, but she just studied at me, then walked away. I really wanted her to like me, but it was useless. She clearly detested me. <sighs> but at least I still have Judy and Dad by my side. Judy tried reassuring me that Mom was a good person and that she just needed a little more time to get to know me better. As for Dad, not only did he send me to a top school, but he also encouraged me to follow my passion. All the afternoons when I got to watch horse racing and bet on the winning horse with Dad were so much fun. And as I watched the horses gallop past, a thought crossed my mind. 
What if Bolt and I were the one on that track, winning the race and bringing back the huge prize money for my grandparents? I couldn't stop thinking about this. So one time, on the way back home from a race, I asked my dad if I could compete, and he didn't even hesitate to reply. Why not? You do have a talent. How about give it a go? Oh god, this was so exciting! My foster dad was the best and I couldn't wait to give this my all and make him proud. After that, he immediately got me a personal coach and a dedicated team of trainers and groomers for Bolt. I'd never felt so happy and Bolt had never looked so good. Everything was great, except that Mrs. Allen still seemed to have an issue with me. Every time I packed for practice, she always frowned and muttered stuff under her breath. Maybe she's irritated about the fact that an adopted child like me was receiving much more than I deserved, or something. But anyway, whether she liked it or not, with my talent, I'll quickly rise to be a brilliant rookie. One morning after practice, Judy came up to me and said, Matilda, can you teach me how to ride a horse? Uh, it might be a little scary for a first-timer. Are you sure you want to try? Yes. Please, if I know how to ride, I can spend more time with dad just like you do. I looked at her angelic, hopeful face. How could I say no? So I helped her onto Bolt and taught her how to hold the reins and do a few commands. It went smoothly at first, but suddenly Mrs. Ellen came out of nowhere and shouted, What are you doing? Judy, come down right now. Startled, Judy misjudged her movements and tumbled off Bolt. As we both rushed over to check on her, Mrs. Allen pushed me aside, which caused me to fall onto my butt. Do you know how important legs are to a ballet dancer? Are you intent on ruining her future? Before I could reply, she shouted, What an incompetent kid! Get out of my sight! Ugh! It was just a few scratches and bruises. Why was she so serious about it? And incompetent? Huh, fine. I'd show her what an incompetent kid can do. From then on, I got my head in the game and continuously won several small and medium prizes. I sent most of my winnings to help out my grandparents and kept the rest to treat Judy and myself to something nice. One day after dinner, Dad called me into his office and told me that the two biggest races of the year, the Grand Shields and the Royal Silver Ford, were coming up in two weeks and he'd already signed me and Bolt up for them. But the two races were only one week apart. That would be too much for Bolt, cause the latest race seemed to wear him out. I mentioned this to Dad, but he was adamant that Bolt would be able to manage it. I didn't want to let Dad down, but I didn't want to hurt Bolt either. I needed time to think about it. As I left the room, I gave a petrified jump. There, in front of me, was a stone-faced Mrs. Allen. She grabbed my arm and yanked me into another room. You can't compete in the races. They are different from your usual amateur events. You're not good enough, and you'll only embarrass our family. Were you eavesdropping on my conversation with Dad? Listen, you're not my mother, so you can't tell me what to do. I will surely join it. Then I stormed out of there. Early in the morning of the first race, I was going to the stables to check on Bolt when it caught one, two of Mrs. Allen's servants sneaking out of there. Hmm, what were they doing here? I went to investigate and, huh? This is not Bolt. What has Mrs. Allen done to my horse? Right at that moment, Mr. Allen walked in with the vet. I told him what I'd just seen and he muttered out, That woman dares to get in my way, huh? I'll make sure she'll pay for it this time. Then he turned to me and said, Leave it to me. I'll find Bolt. Go get some rest and prepare yourself for the race. I'd never seen him this stern before. So I just nodded in concern. Despite all the drama, I still managed to bring home the Grand Shields championship title. It's amazing, right? However, I couldn't fully enjoy the victory as one thing was still lingering on my mind. Mrs. Allen has been absent for the last four days. Could it be that dad has done something to her? Hey, Judy, did Mrs. Allen say she was going somewhere? Dad told me that mom's been so stressed lately. So he arranged for her to go to Aunt Anna's villa to rest. Oh, it seemed like what Dad said at that time was just an expression of anger. <sighs> at least I had one less thing to worry about. You see, my main concern at the moment is Bolt, as his health has clearly deteriorated since the previous race. The vet says he's doing fine, but through Bolt's heavy breathing, I know something isn't right. 
A week passed by and the day of the second tournament finally arrived. While the vet was checking on Bolt before the race, Dad suddenly pulled me outside. We must win today's match. I expect a lot from you. I had a bad feeling about this somehow, but I still nodded and assured him that I would do my best. The race was about to begin. Everything's in check. I'm ready for it. But wait, why does Judy look so flustered? Maddie, mom was not on a trip. The storage room. Dad locked her there because she found out what he was up to. He's doping Bolt. What is she talking about? Could it be that the vet who came in earlier was drugging Bolt then? But no way. If there's anyone wanting to harm me and Bolt, it's Mrs. Allen, not Dad. Listen, Mom only swapped Bolt the other time to protect you. Before I could shape what happened, I saw a burly man covering Judy's mouth and pulling her away. Then a voice whispered in my ear. Only one game left. Just keep your mouth shut and do it properly. If you lose, I can make things very uncomfortable for you and your grandparents. Got it? Now get on the horse. A chill ran down my spine. I felt like I was gonna vomit. How could the caring, kind man I called dad turn out to be such a fraud? The signal of the match rang out. Ugh, what should I do? I couldn't let that wicked man get what he wanted. So I closed my eyes and stayed put. What do you think you're playing at? Run! Run now! Mr. Allen went crazy and rushed over to me. But right at that moment, the organizer appeared and asked me to take Bolt for a health check. They led Bolt away and brought me and Mr. Allen to the office, where I was shocked to see a frantic-faced Mrs. Allen cuddling Judy. It turns out that Judy had freed her mom from the room Mr. Allen had locked her in. Then she'd come straight here and handed the organizers incriminating paperwork of her husband's corrupt doings. Mr. Allen glared at me and shouted, I had to raise you without any benefits just because of her. Now it's your turn to pay me back. Then he immediately charged at me. But Mrs. Allen quickly covered for me and pushed him away. And one of the race organizers restrained him. Don't you dare harm my daughter. Huh? Daughter? Mrs. Allen looked at me with tear-soaked eyes. Sweetie, please give me a chance to explain. I fidgeted the coffee cup in my hand and stared at the ground while Mrs. Allen told me her side of the story. Turns out she really is my biological mom. Could you believe that? After my dad passed away, in her vulnerable state, she fell for Mr. Allen's forced charm and fake words. But he soon showed his real face and heartlessly separated me and my mom after they married. That's why she could only secretly send money to our farm under Mr. Allen's name. Mom also recognized me from the beginning, but she didn't say anything as she knew that Mr. Allen adopted me just to get Bolt, a horse that could help him win some shady bettings. If I knew the truth and rebelled against him, he would harm me. I'm so sorry for all these years, especially these past few months. It has been extremely hard for me, having to treat my dear daughter so badly. But that was the only way to push you away from him, from this rotten house. I didn't want you to be in danger, just like how your real dad was when he worked for him. Please forgive me, Matilda. Tears kept rolling down my cheeks. Turned out, I always had a mother protecting me. Mom pulled me in for a tight hug. Mom! I hugged my mother tightly. I really love and miss you. Please forgive me. I looked up to her and smiled. Of course, yes. I'm more than happy to have you back in my life, Mom. And the best sister I could ever wish for, too. It's not here. Not there either. Where can it be? It's not just any shirt. It's my most prized possession. It has Kendall Jenner, my idol's autograph on it. Franny, your t-shirt was dirty, so I cleaned it for you. Come have a look. Oh, snap. I rushed over to see my precious shirt neatly piled on top of the fresh laundry. No, 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 no. The autograph's completely gone. Grandma! That's right, the person responsible for this unwanted blank shirt is my grandma, who just moved in with us after Granddad passed away. At first, it seemed exciting because my memories about Grandma were all from my happy childhood with her. But now I'm taking it back. She's a literal disaster. You know what? She is getting on in years, but still wants to learn to use social media. My mom even bought her a brand new iPhone 14. Meanwhile, her dear daughter was stuck with this lame iPhone 8. <sighs> Honestly. All she needed was just one of those brick phones that can only take calls. With her forgetfulness, she'll forget all her passwords. 
so it's best to just log in with my iCloud. After all, this phone will become mine anyway. Oh, that's quite a handsome young man. You think so too? Indeed, Josh's attractiveness is second to none. He's every girl's dream man. And yours as well, right? As if I stood a chance. He's notoriously cold, and none of the girls from school seem to interest him. Well, that probably was the only time we shared the same thought. Otherwise, we're always arguing about all kinds of things, especially the way I dress. She didn't even bother asking me before sewing up all my favorite ripped jeans and then left a dress that she'd made on my bed with a note. This adorable dress will suit you much better. I used to love her handmade dresses when I was five, but who even wears anything like this these days? That's not all. She nagged me all the time for straightening my hair instead of keeping it naturally frizzy, since it's supposedly cuter. And guess what? It's actually her who I'd inherited my natural hair from. Bet she didn't know it was the reason I had to grow up with my classmates saying stuff like, you're actually quite pretty, but it's a shame about the hair. And how come you don't have straight hair like your parents? Are you adopted? Those hurtful words made me hate my hair with a passion and wish for beautiful, smooth, straight hair, like Kendall Jenner's. So of course, I'll keep straightening it every day, no matter what grandma says. Thankfully, those complaints will finally come to an end tomorrow, as I'm going back to school after summer break. Yay! Huh? What's everyone buzzing about? At that moment, the teacher walked in and announced that our class will have a very special new student. And then, a very familiar figure entered my class. It was... My grandma? What on earth? Did she get lost on her way to bingo or what? How humiliating. Maybe if I stayed deadly still, she wouldn't spot me and no one would know it was my granny. Oh, my sweetie pie, you forgot your orange juice. All eyes were on me. Good grief. Someone help me disappear from this planet, please. After class, I had to sneak out as fast as I could to avoid having lunch with my grandma. But my best friend Lloyd wouldn't quit teasing me. Suddenly, I heard someone laughing loudly across the room. Grandma? But who is she sitting with? Wow, Joe has quite a peculiar taste in women. He ignores every single girl in this school, but is now completely smitten over your granny. Jeez, why is she bothering him? Joe must have felt uncomfortable. I quickly went over there, apologized, and pulled my grandma away. On the way home from school, my grandma recounted her day just like a little kid would. Do you know that they have vending machines in the hallway with all kinds of snacks? That's genius! And oh my, the campus is big. I almost wet myself while searching for the restroom. <laughs> Tell me which part of this is funny again? It only proves that someone her age belongs in a nursing home, not a high school. I needed to talk to mom. So when she was finally alone in the kitchen, I immediately asked her, how exactly did Grandma end up in my class? It turned out that when my parents invited Grandma to live with us, she told them she would, but only if she could go to school. I think it's a lovely idea. It means she won't be lonely at home all day, as you'll keep her company. Besides, she spent her whole life taking care of our family, so it's our turn to look after her, right? Yeah, I suppose Mum raised some valid points. But who knew that Grandma could turn my school life upside down like this? She clung to me all day, ate whatever I ate, listened to the music I listened to, and even hung out with my friends. Worse still, she told them all embarrassing childhood stories about me, how I used to eat toothpaste because the ad said it was edible, and how I incubated eggs myself to see if I could hatch a chick. But that's not the worst part. She broke my hair straightener, so now I'm stuck wearing this stupid hat. How annoying. Hey, hey, breaking news. What is it this time? Jose has found the girl of his dreams, and she's here at our school. No way. No girls have caught his eye before. Why now? Ah, uh, Franny, what on earth? I look down and, oops, I just accidentally turned him into Sully from Monsters, Inc. Sorry, my bad. Okay, let me see. As Lloyd told me, this was the girl Jose got to know through Tinder before she mysteriously vanished. Moore, 17 years old, goes to my school and, wait. She only has this picture? All I could see was her frizzy brown hair. Out of nowhere, someone snatched my hat. That must be Lloyd trying to get back at me for the paint job earlier. I tried to grumble at him, but only saw Grandma with my hat in her hand. Franny, your hair is so beautiful. Why cover it up? And also, these clothes. The dress I made for you goes far better with your hair. Enough. There's no way I'd let anyone see me with this hideous hair and granny outfit. Please, Grandma. 
Leave me alone and don't cause me any more trouble. This is my school and having you around is embarrassing. She looked shocked and was about to say something, but just left without another word. So, it's been a week since we last talked. It seemed that I was no longer her concern as she made new friends. So it's good for both of us, right? Suddenly, I heard a deep voice behind me. Hi, Franny. Can I talk to you about something? Wait, this voice? I immediately turned around to see Joe standing there, smiling at me. Oh my, this is the first time Joe's ever asked to speak to a girl. All the envious eyes are on me. I'm the luckiest girl here. Has he finally seen my unique charm? The thing is, I happened to see your curly hair the other day, and you look quite like the girl in the picture. I wonder if you are... Oh, he didn't come here because of me. Um, sorry, but I'm not Moore. I could see the disappointment on his face. He apologized for getting the wrong person, but before leaving, he smiled and told me, By the way, you're pretty with that curly hair. Really? That frizzy hair that I've gone out of my way to hide? Can't believe someone out there, besides Granny, actually likes it. A few days later, I arrived at school to a frightening scene. Jose was hand in hand with Amy. Turns out, she had come forwards as the mysterious girl. Let's see, 17? Check. Curly brown hair? Check. And her last name is Moore. There's no mistaking it. But I kept wondering, what is Jose like about this notorious wild girl? Her clique, which now included my dear granny, are always playing dumb tricks for attention. Look, she's no different from a traffic light now that she's friends with them. Once, their group even turned the library into a runway. Obviously, this quickly reached the supervisor, but, well, only my grandma was slow enough to get caught. Thanks to that, she received a ticket to the principal's office and they called in... My mom! Don't you find it ridiculous that a person this age is still getting scolded by the principal? School is not the place for grandma at all. Performing art requires a bold personality, girl. I might be old, but my spirit remains youthful. You know what? I'm going to participate in the Rise to Fame contest as well. I think I may just win. I turned to my mother with begging eyes, but only received a forced smile and a, just let her do what she wants. You'll lose anyway. Why bother? How about you sign up too, and we'll see who wins. Ha! Huh. Fine. Challenge accepted. I'll defeat you easily, Granny. Just wait and see. Finally, Rise to Fame, my school's annual competition, arrived. Each team of three will participate in different rounds, with the two best teams going to the final. First round, handball was a piece of cake for us. Having two sporty types on the team helped with that. As for Granny's team, which consisted of herself, Jose, and Dolly Amy, they were eliminated almost immediately. <laughs> After sports was a Sudoku round. Each team will compete against one another. Whoever solves the puzzle first wins, which should be a breeze because I used to spend rain-filled afternoons playing this game with Granny as a kid. On the other hand, Amy was complaining to the organizing committee that this round was a joke, since Sudoku was so outdated. The more she talked, the more it showed that she's terrible at math and numbers. So it'll be like taking candy from a baby, right? But I forgot Granny was on their team, and unexpectedly, Jose was also very quick-witted. It didn't take them long to solve such a difficult puzzle. Seeing them hugging and celebrating pissed me off. Losing to them by a mere second was the real stinger. Focus, Franny! We had to beat them in the countries and histories round to win. Just a few more minutes till the final round. I was about to leave the waiting room when suddenly I heard a ding coming from this phone left on the chair. It's grandma's phone. But wait, she knows how to use Tinder? Curious, I opened it and on the screen were all the messages from Jose and the mysterious Moore. Why does grandma have this account? And why is Jose convinced Amy isn't who he's looking for? I immediately went to look for my grandma and found her in the corner of the stage wing. But as I approached her, she pulled my hand in and signaled for me to keep silent. <laughs> I thought you let that annoying old hag join the team as a joke. Who knew she'd be so helpful? You'll win easily. Yeah, right? I even heard that history is her strength. I just need her to finish this last round, then I'll kick her out in a heartbeat. The whole group burst out laughing. I nervously turned to look at Granny, but she didn't show any sign of anger. So, what will my grandma do next, you ask? As soon as the final round began, she stood up, took the mic, and announced, 
I want to withdraw from the competition because I will never let two-faced people get the better of me. After that, she left, and the whole audience started to make a fuss, while Amy's face turned pale. However, the real shocker was when Jose also came on stage. Me too. I don't want to be in a team with a liar. Then he walked away as Amy chased after him. The audience buzzed, and the organizers announced that this meant our team had automatically won the competition. I rushed home right after the award ceremony to find Grandma ruminating in the garden. I quietly sat down next to her and put my hand on her shoulder to console her. She looked at me, gently smiled, and started telling me stories I'd never heard before. I discovered that she fell pregnant at 16 and dropped out of school. Her friends weren't very nice to her, so she'd never resumed her education. So now she had time, she decided to go back to school to experience her lost youth. That's why, Franny, you should never let others' mean words get to you. Cherish what you have, because there are still people who love that side of you. What she said was really touching, and it reminded me of Joseph's compliments on my hair. Granny, so what about the Tinder account? Oh, I know you really like Jose, so I created an account to learn more about him so I could help you. Turns out, that profile picture was Grandma when she was younger, hence the similarity to me, and Moore actually was her maiden name. I hugged her and profusely apologized for my poor behavior. She gently patted my head, smiled, and said she'd take me to a secret spot. The next day, I returned to my naturally frizzy hair and put on the dress Granny gave me. It wasn't trendy, but it fit me perfectly, and weirdly, I felt kind of confident wearing it. My grandma and I happily walked into a book cafe when I spotted, Jose, I've brought the person you're looking for here. We both looked at her with questioning eyes. You mean, turned out there was still one thing she hadn't told me, that the alias Moore she put up on Tinder was all based on my preferences, my hobbies, my habits, my taste in music, etc., She'd been collecting everything about me to text Jose. <laughs> I had to let him know there's an interesting girl like our Franny out there, right? That was why Jose didn't feel as compatible with Amy. Then the intelligence round confirmed it, as he and the mysterious girl both had one thing in common, a passion for Sudoku. In the end, everything was cleared up. Grandma is still attending my school, and I actually don't mind it anymore. She brings in homemade cakes for me and my friends, tells us interesting stories about the old days, and gives out the best advice. Most importantly, she made me realize that being me isn't so bad, frizzy hair and all. Almost forgot, you're also wondering what happened between me and Jose, huh? Well, I think you should see for yourself. Hey, I'm Esther of the rising TikTok channel at Aesthetic, where I share my passion for fashion. Look at my newest design, cool, huh? Who would have thought newspaper was a great material for making dresses? I was trying one on and posing for photos when I heard a knock on my door. That's my mom and dad. Esther, we have some good news. We're moving. What? I'm being transferred to another branch in San Francisco. Can you believe we'll be living in that sunny city? No, no, we can't move. I'm, I'm a senior already. All my friends are here. Mom! Just get over it and start packing. This is our one chance at a better life. Why can't they understand that I'm not simply shy, but actually have major social anxiety? It's a real thing that I can't just get over. That's also why my 2 million TikTok followers still haven't seen my face yet. I could barely handle the stress from across the screen, never mind being alone in a brand new school full of strangers. Oh gosh, this place must be twice as big as my old school. It's gonna take forever to find the bathroom. Man, it feels like a thousand eyes are on me. Or maybe not, but I can't risk looking around. What if someone makes eye contact? My palms are sweaty, my heartbeat is so loud I can hardly hear anything else. But then, some hot couple walked in and literally ate up the entire hallway's attention. Good, surely no one would notice me now. It was so exhausting running from one class to the next. Now, where do I sit? I walked over to a table, but no one batted an eye. I wasn't sure if I should sit down or not, when suddenly, a pretty girl appeared. Sky blue. Sorry? Anyway, you're new, right? I'm Jojo, class president. Come sit with us. I followed her to another table. Hi guys, got space for two more? Yeah, sure, the more the merrier. Oh no, that girl doesn't sound too happy about having me here. But it would be too awkward to just get up and leave. 
Uh, hi, I'm Esther. Hey, didn't know they serve fresh tomatoes here. Finish your lunch, Amanda. We have homework to do. Phew. Yeah, think about your homework, guys. Don't mind me. I got to know the school layout a bit better, so the next day wasn't as hard. Until I saw some girl waving at me. She looked like Jojo, but her eyes weren't blue. Must be her twin sister or a doppelganger waving at someone behind me. You really just got ghosted in real life? And you call yourself class president? I flinched. So that actually was the class president from yesterday? How strange. Then, my absolute worst nightmare came true in biology class. We had to work in pairs. Okay, which group would like a new member? Anyone? Please, help a girl out. I see you're in a desperate need of a partner, Zeke. Why don't you raise your hand so Esther can see where you are? I saw an arm at the back of the class, so I walked towards it. Hi, newbie. Esther, right? My name is... Baby Blue Emerald Green? Hey, do my eyes look funny to you, new girl? Jeez, I didn't mean to upset him. So I ended up explaining that I'd had issues with eye contact since I was little. So my mom made me pay attention to strangers' eye colors to make it seem like I looked them in the eye. She even asked me what color their eyes were afterwards to make sure I did what she asked. Well, even though I did, that trick never actually helped me get over my social anxiety. In fact, I usually only notice other people's eye color, not their names or how the rest of their faces look. You're weird, but I believe you. I don't like interacting with other humans either. They tend to pick on me because of my eyes. It shouldn't come as a surprise that us shy kids got along pretty well. Zeke taught me biology and chemistry after class, while I helped him with the Spanish homework. Thanks to him, lunchtime isn't as stressful anymore. We could chat away about anime for hours, and he's supportive of my fashion obsession. So I felt comfortable enough to tell him about my TikTok account. He still liked to tease me from time to time, though. Hi, reader. What color are their eyes? You know, the powerhouses, Colin and Amanda over there? No way. I never look pretty guys in the eye, because I'll immediately turn into a walking tomato. Same thing for hot girls. I don't want them to think I'm trying to pick a fight with them or something. You're that avoidant? Have you ever made eye contact with anyone here except me? Yep. Jojo, the blue-eyed girl. Blue? You know her eyes are brown, right? She likes wearing contacts. Jojo changes her eye color, hair, and accessories every week. She's quite a chameleon. Too bad she seems so smitten with that boring guy Colin Gray. Wow, someone clearly has a crush on Jojo. <laughs> but actually, I think Z could be quite a catch too, if he wasn't so insecure about his heterochromia. Speaking of Jojo, have you heard about her Halloween party? What about it? Well, I thought about going, but I've no costume. Forget it. It's not like she'd notice me there anyway. No, you should definitely go. I can help in the costume department. So, here we are. I'd successfully transformed my timid friend into King Lelouch. Who else but Zeke and his unique eye colors could pull this off? As his personal stylist, he insisted I come with him. I'm not even dressed up though. Oh man, I can hear my heart pounding already thinking about how many people will be in there. But I'm not the type to abandon my friend. So, let's go. As soon as everyone saw his majesty, they went silent. Then erupted when he flipped his cape. Look at him. <laughs> his ego must be through the roof right now. I then swiftly stepped back to a corner. So, this is what a house party is like. Suddenly, I overheard two girls talking. Aesthetic is definitely from our school, or Zeke had some connections. Yeah, I swear this is the exact same outfit Aesthetic has been prepping on her channel. Oh, come on. There could be hundreds of Lelouch costumes during the spooky season. Girls, please stop speculating. Aesthetic is totally not from this school. I- Hey there, what's your costume? A shy, cute girl? I- I, um, nice Stranger Things shirt. Yeah, I look even better than Eddie, don't I? Um, yeah, totes. So I have this thing. Gotta go, bye! Then they ran straight out of there. That was too much socializing for one day. After that party, I noticed Zeke started to hang out with Jojo and became much more confident. I was happy for him, but he was no longer the same guy. One time, we agreed to study together in the library, but he stood me up. When we met the following day, he said he hadn't touched his homework yet because he was out with Jojo. And then, asked to copy mine. Sure, fine. But when he was done, he flat out refused to teach me chemistry as he was too busy. 
things were that way for a while, until today when I found out the shocking truth. Esther, I only keep her around to do my Spanish homework. You know she's a total buzzkill. Excuse me? Your free homework trial has expired. So much for we're friends, huh? Everyone, look! Someone finally came to some self-realization. How adorable! <laughs> Tell them, Zeke! Did you know she has to make her own clothes? Pathetic! Who was this guy? He's the total opposite of the boy I'd got to know over the past couple of months. Am I in the upside down? It's over. Zeke and I were practically strangers now. Back to my gloomy and lonely life. Annoyingly, I saw Zeke again that day, this time on the school paper. This smug jerk gave an interview on the now-famous Lelouch look. However, in that article, Jojo claimed to be aesthetic, the creator behind that costume, while Zeke backed up her entire story. What in the world? And Jojo even showed some of the sketches that I shared on my account. I was furious and went to confront Jojo, but somehow she didn't seem to be faced at all. <laughs> So what if you're the real aesthetic? I can be her too, don't you think? If you have a problem with that, then let's go sort it out. Attention everyone! This is Esther. You probably don't know her, but who cares? She has something to share. The floor is yours, girl. Everyone's gaze turned towards me. Holy moly, where should I look? Why is this so different from talking to the camera? My entire body went into crisis mode. God no, something's coming up. Run! Although I calmed myself down, I couldn't face anyone right now. This is the worst day of my life. Suddenly, someone tapped my shoulder. Amanda? What does this social butterfly want? Did she just ask me if I was okay? Okay? No, I'm not okay. Why is it that girls like you and Jojo, who already have everything, always want to take away everything? Hey, I'm just trying to be nice here. If it wasn't for my silly little friend... What? What are you talking about? Never mind. Sorry, but you don't seem okay. Come with me. I think I know how to make you feel better. Come on. Skipping one class won't kill you, but bad mental health will. I wiped away my tears and went with Amanda, even though I barely knew her. But she had a point. The last thing I need right now is a stuffy classroom. Here it is. Go inside. There'll be someone who can help you. That's weird, but all right. I stepped inside, and it was like being hugged by the smells of wood and paper. It felt healing, for sure. I was browsing through the store, then saw Colin walk over. Startled, I stuck my face into an empty slot on a bookshelf to avoid him, but... <coughs> this place is filled with dust! Surprisingly, Colin only smiled and gently wiped the dust off my face. Um, if you're looking for your girlfriend, Amanda just left. She's not my girlfriend. And actually, I asked her to bring you here. Wh what Why? Just calm down. I got you something. How do you know my favorite genre? Because I've seen you read to calm yourself down before. Turns out, Colin had been observing me from a distance for some time, so he even remembered what I usually read. He was hesitant to talk to me though, afraid that all the unwanted attention he might attract would make me feel uncomfortable. But now, everyone knows I like you. Sorry about that. Don't be. It's my fault and my anxieties. I can help you with that. Esther, would you go to prom with me? How will that help? It will. Trust me. Oh, his eyes are... gray? I realized I've been talking to him all this time just fine without using the old trick. What if this guy really could help me? On prom night, Colin drove me there. While he was parking his car, I waited in front of the venue. Out of nowhere, Zeke approached me. Listen, there's not much time. You gotta listen to me. Jojo plans to give you an award, but it's only to get you to stand on the X mark on the stage where the trap door is. She wants to humiliate you in front of the entire school because you're with the guy she likes. So be careful. What game are you trying to play here? Why are you telling me this? I want to make things right. Jojo took advantage of my feelings for her, and I was too blind to see that she only liked Colin, and she's been using me to hurt you. This is my chance to make it up to you, so please, don't go up there. It's a trap. Stop it already. I won't let you make a fool of me again. Right on time, Colin came to the rescue. Haven't you done enough? Stay away from her. I'm truly sorry, Esther. Inside, we were greeted by Amanda. Congrats, bro. I'm finally free from the Collins rumor girlfriend label. Jojo must be green with envy seeing how cute you two are together. Right. She's here, as well as hundreds of other people. Nope, I can't do this. I quickly crawled under a table and curled up into a ball. Still, Colin remained patient. You are absolutely stunning tonight. Honestly, your dress is amazing. Come out. Let the whole world see you. 
The world will only laugh in my face. Okay, then let me join you. It's actually quite cozy down here. What are you doing? Well, tonight is a special night, and my date's a special girl. So I figured we could totally enjoy it in an unusual way. I feel like my insides just turned into a hot, liquidy mess. Who would have thought that I could meet someone who goes out of their way to make me happy? We chatted for a while, then noticed that the lights outside were dimmed for the slow dance. Let's go. Hand in hand, Colin and I swayed to the melody, feeling like we were the only people in the room. Then, the music suddenly stopped. They were about to present tonight's awards for remarkable students. And now, best dressed of the night award goes to Esther Crawford. No way. What Zeke said immediately came to my mind. I turned around to see Zeke looking concerned and shaking his head. Maybe he'd been telling the truth after all. You don't have to go up there if you don't feel like it. Colin was as understanding as always. But then I saw Jojo's smug face. I couldn't let her win again, so I mustered all my courage and stepped onto the stage, but steered clear of the X mark Zeke mentioned. Thank you, everybody, but I believe another person deserves this award much more than me. She's none other than our hardworking class president, Jojo. That's so sweet of you, but it's yours. Please, step up to receive it. You mean here? No, one step forward. Here? Jojo became impatient and rushed towards me. No, you have to stand here! Right back at you, Jojo. Have a taste of your own medicine. Now that's some headline material for the school paper. <laughs> so, today is the day. My long overdue face reveal. This is such a beautiful dress, right guys? If you're wondering who this strange girl is, Hi, I'm Esther, and I'm the person behind At Aesthetic. This dress right here, it's what I wore to senior prom. Settle in, I'm doing a face reveal and story time video today. Hi, I'm Celine, and I've called the St. Augustine Orphanage home since I was six, but I'm not actually an orphan. You see, my parents are special agents with secret identities. Sweetie, if one day someone suspicious asks you about your parents, run for your life. I was used to these fleeting ghost-like visits from my parents. They often took turns sneaking in and out at night, spending the little time they had with me, and always came together for my birthday. And even though I didn't see them much, they taught me some awesome skills. By the age of 12, I was fluent in five languages, could play a variety of instruments, and do a butterfly kick on anyone who needed it. Despite living a secret life and not seeing my parents as much as I wanted, I still felt lucky that I had them both in my life. It's my 17th birthday, a day I should be super excited about. You see, my parents always visit me together on my birthday, but I've been waiting here for ages and there's no sign of them. This was the first year this had happened. I didn't like it one bit. Something was definitely up. The next day in church, we were singing hymns when I spotted this strange man in the crowd staring at me. My instinct were telling me something was up, so I eavesdropped on him talking to a nun. That girl with blonde hair. How exactly did her parents pass away? He asked about my parents. That meant my life was in real danger. I fled with all my survival skills right away. What really happened to my parents? Have their identities been revealed? I didn't dare to think about it. So I made sure no one was following me before going to the subway and looking for a baggage locker. This was where I needed to come in a run-for-my-life situation. I waited until nobody was around before I opened it with my key. Inside was some money, a dossier documenting a girl's life from childhood to old age, and a letter. Our darling Celine, we're very sorry that you didn't have the normal childhood you deserved. Please don't ever doubt that we cherish and love you with all of our hearts. If you're reading this, it means our identities have been compromised. We've included the documents for your new identity. Stay strong. We will reunite soon. You're a loving mom and dad. XO. If my parents could arrange all this for me, I believe that they could handle anything and come back to me soon. So here I am, under my new identity, Diane. Australia, here I come. My parents left me just enough money to start a new life here, pay for rent, and tuition fees. How perfectly ordinary. Diane's parents were researchers away in the Arctic. She's from a basic family and attended normal public schools, then worked as an office accountant, did not marry, or have children. Everything was boringly safe. The thing is, if I was going to be someone else, then I should at least be someone fun. So I didn't start school. Instead, I created and adopted the identity of 20-year-old Harper and started my first money-making idea, Marriage on Demand. 
With all I'd learned from my parents, I could make a whole lot of money and at the same time experience how a normal family would look like. Perfect. First, I became a Harvard doctor graduate so this privileged guy's parents would give him his inheritance. Next, a posh aristocrat who saved my client from a dreadful arranged marriage. And then, a sweet-natured girl who helped my client intimidate their seriously mean friends. As soon as my clients achieved their goals, the contract ended and we went our separate ways. Before I knew it, through my Harper alias, I'd married nine guys in just eight months and become eye-wateringly rich. But as it turned out, the cases I took were all abnormal families. This tenth contract would be my final case. Then I'd say goodbye to Harper and attend college as Diane before I lost all faith in ever getting the family of my dreams. But while driving to my rendezvous, I swear that car was following me. It could be my parents or someone dangerous. Only one way to find out. Now I just had to wait. If they were dangerous, I'd drive straight off this cliff, then swim to safety. Then I saw this gormless grinning guy peer through my window. He held up a temporary girlfriend contract. Hey, I just want to talk. Could he be my 10th client? Either way, he seemed harmless, so I stepped out of the car. I'm Carlton from the courthouse. You've sure been busy, so I've been assigned to investigate you. As far as I'm aware, it's not illegal to marry multiple times, is it? No, only if they're real and not marriage contracts. Carlton, I only have one client left and I'm not marrying him. I'm his temporary girlfriend, which I believe is legal. So, is there any chance you could turn a blind eye this one last time? Legal or not, I strongly advise you to quit this job and do something more morally upright. Just then, a black car pulled over and a man walked straight towards us. Oh no, had they found me? I'm sorry for getting you into trouble. I turned around, ready to jump, but Carlton suddenly held my hand back. No need for that. My boss won't eat you alive. Besides, I haven't told anyone about the contracts yet. Oh, so this man's his boss from the court? Turns out he and his wife happened to see Carlton on their way to the airport and just came to say hi. Hey, Carl, it doesn't say much if this girl would rather jump into the sea than date you. He looked really awkward and I felt bad for the guy. Without thinking it through, I clung onto his arm and gave him my best adoring look. Actually, we're deeply in love. I'm an adrenaline junkie, but you know Carl. He's just so strict about things like this. You're right. Carl is rather stiff. If you loosened up a bit, you may have been promoted by now. After they left, I explained to Carlton that's what my job is, helping nice guys out of unnecessary trouble. Nothing immoral about it. I was about to leave when he suddenly stopped me. I could see his attitude changed. Please, make a contract with me. I know you could help me improve my communication skills and get me promoted. You can see how desperate I am right now. I wasn't sure. I mean, number 10 was meant to be my last client, but just look at that clueless face. Fine, but in return, you must be an attentive boyfriend, and I want to have dinner with you and your family every evening. Carl looked a bit confused, but he agreed to my demands. Ugh, this was probably my last chance to experience a family life. I have a strict don't be wife two people at the same time rule, so I'm meeting my other client to gently turn him down. Celine, is that you? S Celine, he knew my name? OMG, that's Matten, the genius pianist from the orphanage. Oh no, this was terrible. He could blow my cover. I, um, I was adopted and go by Harper now. My adoptive parents turned out to be a letdown. I had to fake my identity so I could work on my own. I understand. It's so hard for orphans like us to survive. Yes, it sure is. Look, Matten, things got pretty difficult for me, so I had to take another job in a hurry. I can't do two jobs at once. I'm sorry I have to cancel our contract. Yeah, about that. I already publicly announced I have a girlfriend just a second ago. Pianist prodigy Matten confirmed he's currently dating someone? Matten, I really can't do this. Just tell me who your client is. I can make a deal with him. I can't be with them both, so I called an emergency meeting for them to plead their cases. An article accused me of inappropriate behavior towards female artists. It's completely false, of course. I need a girlfriend to distract the public and make them see I'm not a jerk. I want this promotion. If you won't help me, I'll expose you publicly. Pfft, like that matters. I'll just take you back to the US. No, I can't go back there, and I don't want any attention from people either. This is what I'm going to do, Carl. I'll be your girlfriend on weekdays and do anything I can to help you get promoted. In Matin, I'll be your girlfriend, well, pretend to be your girlfriend on the weekend. But my face has to stay out of the media, okay? Once this is done, then it's goodbye Harper and hello, trouble-free, simple Diane. All I have to do is play some music while Matten listens and lets the paparazzi snap photos. I've always admired the way you play music. It follows no rules, but that's what makes it so fearless and fun.
His comment made me pine for my parents. They were the reason I played like that. They taught me in the dark, told me to flow with the rhythms without any rules. I miss them so much. I must admit I'd always had a crush on you. When this is over, I want to protect you. I want to be your family. This was sweet, but he didn't know that I already had a family. I just needed to be patient. Then eventually, they'll be back. On weekdays, I joined Carlton for lunch at work and helped him talk to his co-workers and grumpy boss. Then in the evening, I went to his house and gave him tips on how to be more charismatic, make people trust and warm up to him. I also taught him how to walk without slouching and politely greet people. Hi, Mr. Chair. You look great today. Oh, Miss Lamp, are you okay? You shouldn't lose more weight. You're already gorgeous. Isn't that too much? I've never talked like this before. You're doing great. Carlton followed all my advice. He might be a bit clumsy, but in a cute, endearing way. Still, what I anticipated most was joining his family for dinner. I'd never experienced the cozy and warm atmosphere of a family dinner before. Who knew Carl was such a great cook? And so sweet. After only one week, Carl now had friends at work and his boss gave him extra responsibilities. Meanwhile, Matten's reputation also made a rebound thanks to articles like, he doesn't want to be around other girls because he's so passionately in love with this amazing muse. A frantic week quickly passed, which ended with Carlton's family celebrating his new position, all thanks to me. I was so moved I almost cried, but noticed Carlton seemed off. Maybe he was bummed out as he knew this was the end of our contract. After dinner, we went for a stroll around the garden. Then he blurted out, Who are you really? I was super surprised. Then he told me that one of his new jobs was to investigate a girl called Diane who entered the country, then vanished. I know you're Diane. I can recognize those eyes anywhere. Yes, I'm Diane, but I only faked my identity to earn money. I know you're lying again. It's fine. You've helped me, so I'll help you too. I faked some info to close the case. Thank you, Carl. This means a lot. I knew how important the laws were to him, but he still broke them. For me. I actually quit my job. What do you mean? What about your promotion? You've tried so hard for that. It's okay. I realized I didn't like it so much anyway. I felt terrible that he'd given up his job because of me. But he didn't need me anymore. Our contract had to end, right? Now it's time to end Matten's contract. Then I can go back to being Diane. However, I showed up at the villa to a swarm of reporters. Are you Matten's girlfriend? Please get out of the car. Are you the girl who dates him for dollars, not love? Please show yourself and verify the news. Looks like the news of Matten's girlfriend being a girl who only married for money had leaked. I sat there not knowing what to do. Then I saw Matten coming out of the villa hand in hand with some shiny haired girl. These rumors about my girlfriend are all lies. Amber is a wonderful, kind hearted soul and I couldn't be happier. Oh, I suppose that's pretty smart of him. Finding someone with a nice background was the only way to save his reputation for now. Goodbye, Matten. I wish you well. It seems he couldn't bring himself to ruin his career to protect me the way Carlton did. Now I was free to be Diane and attend this public school my parents wanted me to. Hmm, I was wondering when you'd show up. You're rather popular. A man with a scar has been asking about you. Someone with a scar was looking for Diane? The moment I realized someone was watching me behind the door, my instinct told me to run for my life. I rushed to the window and jumped down, just to catch Carlton peeping at me. What are you doing here? I wanted to see you, so I tracked down Diane. I didn't expect to find you here, but I like you a lot, and there was no time. They saw us together, so I pulled him away. You're driving like crazy, Diane. Who are they? Why are they chasing us? I don't know. All I know is that they're dangerous. He took his phone out to call 911, but I stopped him. No cops. I can't trust anyone but myself, Carl. I'm so sorry for dragging you into this mess. My parents often told me the best way to escape a chase is to jump into the water. However crazy it seems, please trust me. I took a sudden turn and plunged the car straight into the sea. In the water, I unfastened the seatbelt and turned to see Carl already got out of his. He pulled my hand and we swam through the window. The waves drifted us onto a beach, but I had no strength left to move an inch. They're gonna catch us. Celine, sweetie, please wake up. I rubbed my eyes and saw the golden sand, Carlton, and my mom and dad? Am I dead? M mom? No, sweetie, you're very much alive. Turns out the people chasing us were my parents. After 10 years on the job, they finally eliminated the criminal gang and retired. Dad ended up getting the scar, but it's all over now. We could finally be a normal family. You sure made it hard for us to track you down by using a different identity. We should have known our cunning daughter would have created a more challenging life. Like father, like daughter. 
Huh? You're not Diane? Carlton, my name's Celine. Mom, Dad, this is Carlton, my boyfriend. It was so cute seeing him blush. Then he quickly held his hand out and introduced himself to them. It's lovely to meet you both. I care greatly for your daughter and I always will, no matter how mischievous she is. Turns out it's pretty amazing just being Celine. I started school as myself and so far, so good. I'm living with my kind, talented, and normal parents. We're having the best time together, and I get to date this cute, caring chef. The best part is I can finally stop running for my life and just enjoy the people I love most. It was the last lap, and I was in the final stretch. There was only one car ahead of me, and I could see the finish line coming close, so I pushed on the acceleration as far as it could go. Suddenly, I heard a weird noise coming from the engine and lost control at once. The car started spinning like crazy and off the track onto the grass. Hi. I'm Natalie, and it's me behind that wheel. You may be wondering how I got myself into that situation, so let's begin from the start. I was born into a racing family, so the passion for sports naturally ran in my veins. But my life somehow resembled Maggie Payton in the movie Herbie, as my dad didn't allow me to race. Instead, he put all his faith in my adopted brother, Jeremy, and by pouring everything he knew into teaching him with a hope that he'd become a great racer. Only the explanation to this wasn't as complex as in the movie. My mom passed away when I was a newborn, but no vehicle accident was involved. It's just my dad was of the opinion that ladies should be gentle and sweet. So he forbade me from participating in racing or anything even remotely dangerous. Despite that, growing up with Jeremy by my side was truly a blessing. Although not related by blood, we were very close. Jeremy often let me take the wheel of his race car without dad knowing, and he even taught me all he had learned from dad. Over time, I was able to catch up to him in terms of racing prowess. Today, he had a big race, and as usual, I went to his room to check on him. But he was still in bed. His face was pale, and obviously, he was in pain. Jeremy, what's wrong? I think I got food poisoning from that gas station hot dog. Gosh, just drop it. You can't drive in this condition. I can't. This is the qualifying round for the championship season. Dad will be so disappointed in me. So, there's only one way. Hey, I can drive in your place. Are you crazy, Natty? Blah! Jesus, see? There's no time. Under the racing gear, nobody can tell us apart. He was reluctant for a while, but finally gave in. So here I am, in a super cool appearance. I felt a wave of exhilaration that sent me sprinting to the track. Passing other racers with deft accuracy, I left trails of smoke in my wake as I smoothly swerved into the tight turns. When I reached the final lap, I gave it my all and finished in first place. Yippee! I got back to the waiting area after the race, then was suddenly dragged away. Hey, Jeremy's here. I'm all right now. Just want to make sure you made it out okay. Congrats on first place. Thank you. Now switch clothes with me. They need to see your face on the podium. As Jeremy raised up the trophy, I couldn't help but imagine myself in his place, overcome with happiness. That evening, the race was replayed on TV. Jeremy, your style is different today. You finally understood how to drive more freely. I've always said you have potential, yet you don't have the guts to shatter limitations. But if you keep racing like that, we may need to get you another trophy shelf. Uh, yes, I'll try. You were really cool today. Keep up the good work. After that race, I still felt the electric rush lingering in my bones. So I asked Jeremy to let me keep taking his place. Enough, Natty. Last time I did it as a last resort. You don't really want to be a racer anyway. Let me help you. In the meantime, you can focus on your passion. Seeing him hesitate, I continued. If you're afraid of being caught, just be there at all times so we can swap back whenever we need to. Jeremy's Jeremy. Couldn't say no to my puppy eyes. After that, I wore Jeremy's racing suit and entered all of his competitions. During that time, Jeremy would covertly hide among the crowd and wait. Oh, did I mention that my brother is a huge crochet fanatic? He even runs an Etsy business stocked with incredible pieces he made all by himself. Things were going kind of smoothly, but public practice was out of the question because we had to keep this a secret from dad. So Jeremy's plan was for me to pretend to be dating the team mechanic, Royce, also his best friend. This would give me an excuse to go to the track on a regular basis to practice. The following day, Jeremy took me to meet Royce, and luckily he was so friendly and agreed to assist us right away. Although balancing school and racing was hard, I still nailed it beautifully. At school, nobody knew I came from a racing family as we never appeared together in public. Not to brag, but a lot of guys were smitten with me. However, this dude, Liam, stood out. He's actually Jeremy's biggest racing rival, so I couldn't help but laugh internally as he made many attempts at wooing me in school. If you were a vegetable, you'd be a cute cumber. 
just to turn green with envy at me on the racetrack as he had no idea it was me under this costume. <laughs> it made sense, given he hadn't lost to Jeremy this many times before. Yeah! Hey, Jeremy, what's your deal? Your racing style has changed so drastically. Just then, a staff member from our team turns to me. Yeah, and you've been really quiet lately. Uh, um... <clears throat> I'm just focusing on the competition. And so, this began my official rivalry between Liam and I. We were racing neck and neck, but all of a sudden my engine died and stopped in the middle of the track. I watched as a few cars zoomed past me and Liam took the win. My win! Seeing that dude get out of his car and reveal his smug face had my blood boiling. The next week, I was in another race to make up for last week's fiasco, but this time I had a flat tire. Were the racing gods against me beating Liam? Due to my recent losing streak, some of my sponsors threatened to have their sponsorship withdrawn if I don't win the next race. So this time, I got Royce to double check. No, triple check that the car was ready to race. I scrutinized every nook and cranny, same as the last few races. If something goes wrong again, then my guess is that you have a petty guy willing to sabotage you. My next race was going well, but on the last lap, as I reached a tight turn, I pressed on the brake and my car was not slowing down. Time seemed to slow as the wall rushed closer. My palms clenched the steering wheel. It was a dance of split-second decisions and instinct, but I managed to swerve, the tire screeching in protest as I narrowly avoided disaster. Close shave. I looked over to the finish line and saw that Liam had once again secured first place. He was definitely behind this. So I quickly got changed and barged into Liam's waiting room to confront him. Oh, my angel. What are you doing in this fiery battlefield? It's you who played tricks on me, my brother, right? Spit it out. Your brother? Who? Jeremy Wilson? You sabotaged someone else's car too, or what? What are you talking about? Drop the act. You're the one who benefits the most if my brother loses. Recently, his car kept breaking down. This can't be a coincidence. It just seems like luck is on my side. See, the girl I like also happens to come from a famous racing family. We're a match made in heaven. How can you be so casual about this? Don't you know how dangerous it is to drive with broken brakes? If not for my driving skills, I would have been injured. Wait, your driving skills? Were you the one driving the car? Um, I mean, my brother. Oh my god, it's you! I knew something's off lately. Watch your tongue. I, I didn't say anything. Focus on the actual conversation. You either confess to the crime or I will investigate and expose your true face to the whole world. Mark my words. I couldn't believe I just let my secret slip to my biggest rival. If Jeremy knew this, he'd definitely tell me to quit racing. So after a sleepless night, I decided to meet Liam for a proper talk, but he found me first. Are you Google? Because you have everything I'm searching for. Stop messing around. I'm not done with you yet. The you broke my car case? I had no idea about it, I swear. I'm competitive, but not that low. But isn't it normal for a car to suddenly break down sometimes? Put that aside. Anyway, have you told anyone about my identity yet? No, but what's up with that? I want you to keep your mouth shut. So let's make a deal. What do you want? Except for a date like in some sappy rom-coms, of course. Then nothing. Just don't avoid me anymore. And tell me why you have to disguise as your brother. That's none of your business. All right, then I'll ask someone else. Ugh, fine. Just promise you won't tell anyone. Then I told Liam everything. And since that day, he had officially become my shadow. No matter at school or on the track. I need to complain to Spotify for not naming you this week's hottest single. Oh, wow, they really look cute together. Even though they're competitors, love always wins. And that's how we accidentally became a gay couple in the racing scene. At first, I found Liam very annoying, but soon I realized his great passion for racing matched my own, and his insights into the racing world were unexpectedly captivating. I found myself opening up to Liam, sharing my thoughts and feelings with ease, and somehow felt happy around him. But the mystery around my broken car hadn't unfolded, so I couldn't let my guard down. And here comes the last qualifying match before the championships. My dad was also here today to motivate everyone. I was so nervous, yet still had to act lovey-dovey with Royce in front of dad. Obviously, Liam wasn't happy about that. He kept coming in between us, even though he knew we were just pretending. Natalie, focus! I couldn't stand to keep my secret any longer. So I gotta carry the day to prove myself, then reveal the truth to him and race under my own identity. I turned on the engine's full power and felt its huge force as I raced. My helmet fought the wind, and the air surge was like a thrilling symphony. 
It was the last lap, and I was in the final stretch. There was only one car ahead of me, Liam's car, and I could see the finish line coming close. So I pushed on the acceleration as far as it could go. As I raced past him, I was both precise and fast. My heart pounded in my chest, and I could feel an adrenaline rush through my body. Suddenly, a strange sound came from my car, and I lost control at once. The car started spinning like crazy and off the track onto the grass. I was dizzy, but lucky enough, not a scratch. As I came to, the first person I saw was Liam. He dropped everything just to check that I was okay. He took me to my pit stop, where my teammates rushed over to support. Suddenly, my dad appeared. I was panicking, and I didn't know where to go or hide when... Natalie, no need to hide anymore. I already know. (gasps) How? That doesn't matter. Look at you. What a mess. I just wanted to prove to you that I can do it. This is my passion. Why do you always stop me? Your passion? You mean falling off the track? You just ignored all the times I'd won first place. You're a terrible, selfish, evil father who has no love for your children and always forces others to do this, do that. People don't respect you because they want to. Everyone only listens to you because they're afraid of you, just like me and Jeremy. Just then, Dad slapped me hard across the cheek. I stumbled back and fell onto Liam. It was you, wasn't it? I, uh, I'm sorry. I just couldn't watch you get yourself in danger anymore. Meeting you is my entire life's greatest regret. Before anyone could see me cry, I ran away. I have nothing left. No one understands me. No one. I lay there in my room, consumed by a cloud of gloom after Dad's week-long grounding. Suddenly, a pebble knocked at my window. It was Liam. He was trying to throw a rope up to me. After a moment of hesitation, I finally climbed down. I'm sorry I went behind your back. I didn't know your dad would go that far. I care about you and just want you to be safe. But now I realize the way to do that is to find the true culprit who vandalized your car. Liam's apology felt really sincere. Look at him. I couldn't stay mad forever. The last time you raced, you never left your car side. The pre-checks are where we need to look into. Are you sure you can fully trust this Royce guy? He's my brother's best friend. Why would he sabotage me? You're just being subjective. Suddenly, a memory resurfaced in me. (gasps) Last week, I saw Royce lingering around the car for longer than the usual inspection. He told me that I need a new head gasket or else I wouldn't be able to accelerate without blowing the engine. Now, when I think of it, it seems kind of fishy. So we rushed to Royce's shop immediately. Natalie, what are you doing here? I'm sorry to hear things have been rough between you and your dad. But you're not sorry for almost taking my life? What are you talking about? Cut the act. I've got all the evidence against you. What evidence? Shut up. I have CCTV footage of your criminal acts. If I give it to the racing committee, you'll be out for good. What do you think? My hands were trembling as I hoped that Royce couldn't see through my bluff. But shockingly, Royce's face went pale and he crumbled to the ground. All right, Natalie, it's me. But I didn't mean to hurt you. I just want to help Jeremy. How does that help Jeremy? Actually, I have a crush on him and Jeremy confided in me once. I don't know what to do. I love Natalie very much, but I always feel self-conscious in front of her. I'm just an adopted child. Becoming a racer is all that my dad wishes for me. If I stop racing, he won't love me anymore. Meanwhile, Natalie's far better than me from the beginning. If dad finds out I'm such a loser, he will disown me. Jeremy, my poor brother. I just wanted to scare you into not racing. Everything I did to your car was carefully deliberated beforehand so that you wouldn't get hurt. I'm sorry. I'll find a way to fix everything. I got home later that night, only to hear arguing from the living room. What you did to Natalie was unfair. You kept her from doing what she loves, just like me. I've never dared to admit this, but now, Dad, racing isn't my passion. This is. What? But you find it too girly, right? Actually, I just race to please you. And only this simple thing makes me happy. Unable to stand by. I interjected, revealing how Jeremy was living in so much fear among his own family. They were shocked for a moment. Then Dad said, Jeremy, it's all my fault to put so much pressure on you and make you feel like you weren't loved enough. You're always my son, no matter if you choose racing or not. And Natalie, I'm sorry for hitting you. The pain on your cheek may have gone, but still lingers in my hand. I just didn't want to risk losing you. I never told you this, but when your mother was pregnant with you, she got sick, and I could have lost both of you when she went into labor. Ever since that day, I swore to keep you safe, alive, and healthy. Dad, I love you, but I love racing too. I hope that I can count on your support on the track. Then I revealed that Royce was the one who sabotaged my car. 
They were both shocked and furious, especially Jeremy. But after being told the full story, they decided to forgive Royce as he showed his remorse by confessing his crime and was temporarily suspended. We had not seen him since then. True compassion lies not only in caring for someone, but also in caring for them in the right way. Misguided intentions can unintentionally sow the seeds of unintended consequences. Finally, I could officially join the race using my own name. Dad came to see me today as well. He seemed quite concerned, but encouraged me anyway. Suddenly, Liam approached me. If I win this time, fair and square, would you go on a date with me? You have no chance to win, but a date? You earned it. I raised the bow, hyper-focused. The target was right in front of me. Watch me conquer. Only... Grandpa, that one would have hit the bullseye. I'm just teasing. <laughs> You're getting real good, pumpkin. Hi, I'm Gina, and I love archery. My grandfather, my only family, introduced me to the sport. He always encouraged me to join contests, saying I had a knack for it. But competition's not really my thing. Talking to strangers was enough of a challenge for me. But my only friend, Bailey, is lovely and cheerful. We've been close since childhood to the day we came to the city for high school and became roommates. My new life promises fun and excitement, but I missed my grandpa dearly and wrote to him often. Dear Grandpa, my life here is wonderful. The dorm room is nice, clean and tidy, and every morning, soothing instrumental music from the speaker reminds me of the times we enjoyed music and a tea together on the front porch. Ugh, Bailey, turn it down. And are you going to do something about your mess? Jeez, it's an organized mess. Ask me about anything, and I can find it immediately. By the way, there's a welcome party for freshmen tonight. Shall we go? Nah, I'm too tired. Come on, Gina, it'll be fun. You'll make some new friends, too. It's just... Okay, stay here then. I'm leaving. Somehow, I felt a bit empty. I'd never noticed that Bailey and I were so different until recently. Bailey's a social butterfly who can make new friends easily. And me? I was introverted and reserved. Hmm, I can't keep being this way. I came to the city for the experience. Duh. So when Bailey asked me to go to the school's fair, I immediately agreed. When the day came, while Bailey's chatting and giggling with other students, I just kind of absentmindedly faded into the background. Since Bailey did not seem to notice my absence, I decided to look around on my own. Suddenly, a scream startled me. Thief! Thief! I turned around to see a thief running away with a girl's handbag. Without thinking, I grabbed a set of bow and arrows nearby and shot at him. That's when I saw another arrow. Flying in the same direction, both arrows hit the thief right on his head and knocked him to the ground. I looked for the other archer and saw the Greek god Apollo, who's also looking at me. Then he went to handle the thief as I took the opportunity to quietly leave the scene. I was still daydreaming about that guy when Bailey barreled into our dorm with a group of friends. I quickly turned myself into a burrito and pretended to be asleep. But Bailey ruthlessly unfurled me with a wide grin. Hey, G, there's someone I'd like you to meet. Samantha, head of the school's archery club. Bailey told me you're quite an archer. Yeah, sort of. Well, we're looking for new members. You should come by. I'll be sure to stop by. Thanks. After school the next day, I visited the archery club and saw a familiar face. That's the guy from yesterday. Ooh, he also blows on the arrow like Grandpa. So cute. Oops, busted. Am I hallucinating or is he walking toward me? Hi, you were at the school fair. Your shot was phenomenal. I'm Chris, by the way. I'm Gina. So you're new here? Actually, I'm not sure if I'm going to join yet. Well, how about a little demonstration? Panicked, I tried to shoot with shaky hands and totally botched it. Sorry. Relax, you got this. He leaned over me and my heart was beating like crazy. I took a deep breath, softly blew at the fletching, and this time, I hit the target. See? Amazing shot. You should be more confident and open up so more people can get to know you. So Chris is into extroverts? He's right. It must be great being around an outgoing, confident girl like Bailey. She'd only been here for a week and already knew half of the school, and everyone loved her. So later that day, after struggling with myself, I decided to ask Bailey for help. Help? With what? Help me be you, an extrovert. You're fine the way you are. Why change? Right then, Samantha came to pick her up to go to a birthday party. Want to join us? Uh, you'd rather stay here and re, correct? You know me. Then Bailey left, just like that. All right, if she doesn't want to help, I'll do it myself. Time to break out of my cocoon. 
So I spend the next few hours giving myself a makeover. Not bad, was it? When I arrived at the party, everyone gawked at me. Hey, are you the sun? Cause your beauty is blinding me. If so, you should stay 93 million miles away from me. As much as I wanted to run straight home, a voice in my head kept screaming, socialize. On the internet, they said extroverts are always ready to make friends, like Bailey, who's part of every single conversation. So I mustered all courage to throw myself into the largest group who's talking about cute Arctic animals. I remembered a communication tip, lead the conversation. So I did. Isn't it so sad that those animals are losing their habitat to climate change? The next five minutes was me monologuing about the issue, but they didn't seem too interested. Okay, plan B. Bailey also always knows how to stand out, so when everyone started dancing, I stood in the middle of the room and danced my heart out. But after that, everyone looked at me like I was an alien, including Chris. When I was finally in my room, I felt totally defeated. Do you seriously want to be an extrovert? I need to, Bailey. If so, maybe take it slow and don't push yourself too hard. You don't have to become outgoing overnight. Ugh, Bailey clearly didn't believe I could do it. Fine, I'll show her she wasn't the only charming extrovert here. My first order of business was joining the archery club. That would be my best chance to impress Chris. To make up for the embarrassment at the party, I braced myself and approached the most playful guy here. Uh, hi, I'm Gina. I like your shirt. Um, thanks. I'm Patrick. Patrick is the student council president. He's here to help promote the archery club. Then whenever Chris passed by, I tried to joke around with Patrick, although he seemed distracted. But Chris just turned away and looked unhappy. Gina, what's the deal with you and that Chris guy? He keeps looking over here. Oh, Chris? He's just a club mate. Maybe it's because he doesn't like me very much. Boys thing. Anyway, I'm thinking about joining this club. Would you teach me? Sure thing. After that, Patrick and I often practiced archery together. I got too excited and set the target as far as I could, pulled a string with all my might, and tried to keep my cool as the arrow hit the bullseye. Out of nowhere, Chris popped out. Awesome, Gina. Best shot I've ever seen. Impressive, Gina. Wanna grab a drink before you teach me how to do that? Right then, Chris offered me a bottle. You like apple juice, right? I saw you only drink that at the party. Eee! He noticed! Thank you! Would you like a ride back later? Finally, a chance to get closer to Chris! I'll drive you, Gina. I'm more familiar with that route. I was gonna say no, but Patrick had already pulled me away. Why did he ruin my romantic moment? Maybe he liked me too, but I already had my sights set on Chris. Chris seemed to care about me, but it would take a little more for us to actually be a thing. Everything was falling into place, and I felt like I was becoming more outgoing. Though sometimes I still took detours or hid in the restroom to avoid small talks, things with Chris were going well. But the next day, I saw Bailey and Chris locking arms and laughing happily on the street. Are they dating? Then why did Chris keep my hopes up and act like he cared about me? All my efforts were for nothing. Even if I tried to be like Bailey, of course Chris would prefer the original. I glumly went to my room shortly before Bailey, Holly, jolly as usual, came back. You look awfully happy. Hot date? Nope, not at all. Are we having secrets now? Of course not! Anyway, what are you up to today? Beating around the bush, huh? She's obviously in love with Chris, but why keep it a secret? Just so they could still mess with others' feelings. After that, I refused to talk to Bailey and avoided Chris. Whenever he greeted me, I'd pretend I didn't see him. And if he approached me, I'd go to Patrick or ask him to take me home. It was petty, but what else could I do? In Patrick's car, I got Chris's texts. He probably just wanted to two-time me, so I turned off my phone. Everything okay? Yeah, I'm fine. You're not a very good liar, but I have just the thing to cheer you up. A few minutes later, we pulled up to a quiet spot with a stunning view. But magnificent as the sunset was, I still felt the sadness wash over me. Want to talk about it? And I did. I really did. It felt good to finally get everything off my chest. Patrick listened patiently, nodding and understanding. When I finished, it's already twilight. Thank you for listening to my rant. Sure, anytime. Uh, I want to be there for you, Gina, and I would never hurt you. I know you're into Chris, but I really care about you. You're a true hidden gem, and I want to help you be all that you're meant to be. I was surprised. At that moment, Patrick became even more attractive than I'd ever thought. Maybe I could, I should, be with someone like him and forget about those toxic people. So, I agreed to date him. The following day, Patrick already made it public. See, that's what a decent guy would do. He took me to the spa, cooked for me, and was always so sweet. 
I'd never felt this way for anyone, and it actually felt like love. However, it wasn't always peachy being Patrick's girl. He constantly attended tons of events as the student council president and would have me as his plus one. On those occasions, Patrick would talk to everyone while I stood awkwardly. I wanted to join, but didn't know how. All right, laughing would totally show that I'm following their conversation. But everyone just stared blankly at me. What's so funny about my grandma's broken hips? Oh, jeez, I wanted to dig myself a hole immediately. Soon after, Patrick told me to utilize my archery skills for a fundraising commercial shoot. The pictures went viral, and I became popular. People wanted to befriend me everywhere I went, and it was exhausting. When I told Patrick, he said, That's good. You'll be the face of this fund, which will help a lot of people. Like Katniss Everdeen and the First Rebellion. I'm so proud to have you as my girlfriend. Let's keep this up, okay? Something about that didn't sit well with me. But isn't this the life I've always been dreaming of? I was so busy with Patrick's plans that I had no time left for myself. I even forgot to write to Grandpa, and it had been a while since I last went to the archery club. Bailey tried to catch up with me, but I still ignored her. We grew further apart, even though we shared a room. The show today was suddenly canceled, so I seized this chance to drop by the archery club. I got more comfortable and liberated with each arrow I shot. I finally felt like myself again. When I was done, I caught Chris staring at me. I was instantly flustered and tried to leave, but Chris followed me. Gina, I don't even recognize you anymore. It's like you're trying to be someone you're not. Are you really happy? You're the fake one. You like social butterflies, don't you? If I stop trying, I'll become invisible again. You just don't like Patrick, and it bothers you that he's my boyfriend. You're right. I don't like him, but it has nothing to do with this. Not wanting to hear any more of his lies, I just stormed off. But as much as I didn't want to believe Chris, his words got me thinking. I found Bailey waiting for me in our dorm room. She looked a bit timid. How are things going between you and Patrick? Everything okay? Of course. You got a problem with us? <sighs> Can you come with me after school tomorrow? There's something I want to show you. I followed her out of curiosity. Bailey led me to the back of the school, then told me to hide in a corner and wait. Then I saw Patrick. He wrapped his arm around Bailey, who promptly pushed him away. Come on, I know you've got a thing for me, Bailey. Why won't you leave me alone? You literally have a girlfriend. Pfft, Gina, I made that chick who she is. A cash grab to make a quick buck off of. That stupid girl still believes that was actually a fundraiser. I could have picked anyone, but the fact that it bothers Chris when I'm with her was the icing on top. I can't be with that obnoxious weirdo, but you? A magnificent work. I can't take it anymore and bolted towards Patrick and slapped him right across his smug face. You are the biggest jerk I've ever met. Uh, you're the biggest loser I've ever met. You have the magnetism of a towel. Watching you embarrass yourself in front of all my friends is painfully terrible. No wonder they snicker about you behind your back. I dashed away in tears as Bailey scolded him. She caught up to me shortly after. I'm sorry you had to find out this way. Recently, Patrick started flirting with me. I couldn't go without showing you his true colors. You can say that because everyone loves you. Even Chris chooses you. And I thought I had a chance with him. It's so unfair. People will never treat introverts like me the way they treat you. <gasps> Wait, you like Chris? Having no energy left to be angry, I slumped down, sobbing. Listen, I'm sorry that I refused to help you become an extrovert. The reason is, you're already amazing, Gina. Since we were kids, I've always admired you. You're smart, patient, and determined. What? Would you believe me if I said I wanted to be more like you? But then I realized that introverts and extroverts have their own strengths, and we do best when we're ourselves. That's why I am who I am, and you should be none other than yourself. I held back my tears as best as I could and hugged Bailey tightly. I'm sorry for misunderstanding you. Thank you for telling me what I need to hear. I returned to my room and saw a letter from Grandpa. He asked how I was lately and why I stopped writing to him. He knew living in a new environment would be difficult, but as long as I understood my own worth, I could overcome everything. He finished his letter by saying he'll always love me unconditionally. Tears welled up in my eyes again. Shortly after, Bailey came back all excited. I have a surprise for you. When we got outside, Chris was already waiting. I was extremely embarrassed and confused to see him. Gina, from the moment we met at the fair, I haven't stopped thinking about you. I was impressed with your archery skills, but before I knew it, I was charmed by your intelligence, kindness, even your shyness. Aren't you dating Bailey? 
What? Chris is my cousin. He talks about you all the time. I was going to set you two up, but you were already with someone else. <laughs> I couldn't believe my ears, and my heart went wild. At that moment, Bailey received another flirty text from Patrick. Ugh, what am I supposed to do with this sleaze ball? Well, well, well. Could you believe it? Bailey let him hear blindfolded for a surprise. Okay, ready for my present? Patrick was surely surprised to see me aiming him right at him. You better come clean about all the cheating you did. It wasn't cheating. You weren't even my girlfriend, loser. Before he could finish, I launched an arrow right above his head. Lucky for you, my aim was just right. But who knows, a loser like me could have missed. Patrick freaked out and literally peed his pants. Then he confessed to all his faults, siphoning off public funds, love scamming for money, which all had been recorded. As soon as the video was posted, Patrick was boycotted and lost his student council president position. He had to switch schools after a week. I finally felt confident in myself and won many archery competitions. During the holiday, I brought Bailey and Chris back home to meet my grandpa and showed him my many trophies. Remember everyone, be the best version of yourself and the right person will love the real you. No one told me it's this windy up here. I'll probably be wiped off of Earth before I could wipe all these windows. It's okay, Harper. Remember, you're doing this for Aaron. Just a bit of tough work for now, but imagine the incredible time you'll be having at the concert. Imagine, oh my god, Aaron and her? Hold up, let's start from the top. Hi, I'm Harper, the biggest fan of the greatest boy band, The Statics, especially their rapper Aaron. I turned 18 not long ago, and I'm taking a gap year to find my true passion. To be honest, I'm not really interested in anything. The only thing that makes me feel alive right now is fangirling, following my boys around, concerts, touring, etc. But after months of that, I'm totally broke. Not to mention Aaron's having his solo debut album. So, having no choice, I asked my super sweet boyfriend Kirk to lend me some money. But, again, all you ever did was spend relentlessly on this trash. You don't study, nor get a job. How are you expecting to afford it all? Do these idols feed you or give you a roof over your head? I don't think so. I can't help you forever either. Trash? He called my passion trash? Excuse me, I asked for a loan. Not like I was robbing him. He wasn't like this the other times. Finally showing his true self, huh? Fine, I don't need an unsupportive boyfriend. Anyone that stands between me and my happiness can get lost. So, we're over. Whatever. But wait, I still need to come inside. As Kyra's bestie, not as your girlfriend. You might be wondering what kind of relationships I have going on here. Well, I actually befriended Kyra first. We were both ecstatic. Fandom of the statics. If you know, you know. Fangirl's bond is stronger than any friendship. Her mom works for a big press, so she sometimes could even get us access to shows. Cool, right? So I was always around her place. One thing led to another. Me and her brother fell in stupid love, but not anymore. Have you heard about Aaron's new album? Apparently, it will be followed by a group concert right downtown New York. We can ask Kirk to give us a ride. It will be super fun. Oh, don't want to burst your bubble, but I just broke up with Kirk. Four minutes, 36 seconds ago? No way! Yes way! I told her how ridiculous her brother was, but she's still trying to find excuses for him, hoping to mend us back together. But sorry, this heart of mine has casted the dice. It's entirely dedicated to Aaron now. No more, dumb boyfriend. And that's how I ended up taking on this dangerous job. Its high salary could get me boxes of albums, and a concert ticket even. But what am I getting instead? My beloved idol, arms in arms with a singer I hate the most on earth, Bianca. Aaron and Bianca rushed to the window and dragged me inside. Please don't let anyone know this. What do you want? Autograph? VIP ticket? Please, you probably know our two fandoms are like water and oil. They already opposed us so badly over a collab last time. Yeah, of course I know, because I was the one who opposed. Seriously, what does Erin see in this girl? She always says controversial stuff, gets caught in dating rumors with all guys on Earth, parties 24-7, and her songs suck. But on a second thought, it's not every day to have the two hottest celebrities on their knees before me like this. Maybe I should act wisely. Either way, this is the lifetime opportunity for me stepping into Erin's life, isn't it? Okay, I'll keep a secret on one condition. Let me be the manager of Bianca. Bianca's manager? Who's looking for me? Wait, who are you? 
but he didn't even bother to wait for my answer and started stacking out bunches of stuff for Bianca to sign. Being a manager ain't a joke. See, Will's been doing this for years and still struggling. Well then, more reason for me to step in. So I walked over to give him a hand. This poster is mid. Next time, let me handle it. Trust me, I've designed countless stuff for fan events. The title track this time is a bop, but without a good promotion, it turned into a flop. I suggest you make some TikTok challenge for it. I'm a girl Bianca's age. I for sure understand her and the fans more than you. I'll be useful. Right, guys? Y yeah sure. She has a point, Will. You do need an assistant. Right then, Will had a phone call. Seemed urgent. After hanging up, he turned to me. Fine. It's true that I'm overloaded. I have to check stuff at the venue right now, but Bianca has schedules at the radio station in an hour. Can you get her there? Sir, yes, sir. Just like that, I helped Will around, and it's safe to say I was basically Bianca's sub-manager. Life was pretty sweet. I got to tag along to shows for free while keeping an eye on my love rival. I sure enjoyed playing God with my new puppet. Everything Bianca eats has to get my approval. Bye-bye, yummy tacos and burgers. She's only allowed to use the phone at certain times of the day. Stop texting boys and start working on your terrible music, honey. Then tell those annoying boys to stop bothering me. Even her sleep is strictly fixed, just because I love seeing her suffer. <laughs> And I make sure her schedule is packed. Vocal training, dance practice, filming content. Girl, you have a lot to work on. But on days where she worked with aesthetics, I'd let her off a little. Still, that doesn't mean these two could flirt under my nose. Seriously, it's like you guys are begging to get caught. Think about your future. This dumb fling won't matter a bit the day your career is on the edge of failing, won't it? <laughs> I'd make a good manager, right? But I occasionally saw Liam, another member of Statics, being way too chatty with Bianca. Well, as long as it's not my Aaron. But I know someone who wouldn't like this. Kyra, as Liam's her bias. <laughs> I guess the rumors are true. Liam is a playboy. And to prevent Aaron from getting caught in the same thing, I accidentally arranged Bianca's schedule to be 100% off with Aaron's, so they couldn't meet up. But Bianca still asked me to bring him gifts often, and surprisingly, Aaron wasn't too upset about his girlfriend not showing up. I guess I can get him in another level that Bianca couldn't. We soon talk a lot and hang out also, and he literally blurted out about how Bianca was so uptight, how some of her annoying habits gave him the ick, and that being with me was so much more comfortable. Uh-oh, sounds like love's fading. <laughs> on the other hand, Bianca was extra upset that they still couldn't date on their anniversary. Not on me, though. Aaron himself didn't want to see her and made excuses about how paparazzi had been up in his grill because he's been doing so well lately. But Bianca has had enough with this all. She wanted to go public. I heard her talking to Aaron on the phone about it. No, that's not gonna happen. I have to be a step ahead. I immediately searched for a photo, then posted it anonymously on a fan forum. If Aaron goes public with anyone, it's gotta be me. But oh boy, maybe I've not thought this through. What was I even thinking? The next day, the internet went crazy and it's all negative comments. Thankfully, Aaron's side has spoken up and calmed it down by fabricating a story about how this was from a long time ago. And it was his first love, blah, blah. Anything, as long as things go down. I haven't even finished my sigh of relief. Then, out of nowhere, Aaron's stomping into our studio looking furious. R.I.P. me. Bianca, have you lost your mind? I told you I did not agree. Why did you post our photo? Are you trying to sabotage me? Sorry that you don't have a career so you can act careless all you want. But I do. I have my reputation and an army of stupid fangirls to please. I was frozen, as well as Bianca. Right then, a call came from Kyra. I swiftly sneaked out to take it. It's you, right? The lucky girl in the photo? I can tell by just one look. Last time we talked, you only mentioned seeing Bianca in real life or something. When did Aaron come into the picture? How could you not tell me? I was dumbfounded, didn't know how to handle this. I mumbled out a few words so Kyra would keep this a secret and that we'd talk later. Okay, gotcha. But then help me meet my Liam, please. What? No, trust me, he's a player. They all are. Get over him. So Kyra recognized me that easily. But why Aaron didn't? He even mistook me with his so-called girlfriend, Bianca. That picture was also taken at the secret balcony of his penthouse that he swore he'd never taken anyone there before. Having too much on my mind, I wandered to his place, but ran into... Liam? He's talking to a girl. She wiped her tears, then left. I should get going. Don't want to mess with another player right now. Harper! What? 
Don't worry, I won't tell anyone about that 400th girlfriend of yours. Correct, it's the 400th girlfriend, but not of mine. Turns out, that girl's also a victim of Aaron the Heartbreaker, not Liam. Liam has always been the one who's cleaning after his mess, making sure the girls are all right and won't do anything harmful to the band's reputation. Probably that's why the public labeled me as the player. I always got caught up with these heartbroken girls. <laughs> and now you... What do you mean? I'm okay. Come on, I know you also got tangled in Aaron's love web. I'm sorry, I could have warned you earlier. I've been trying to hint it to Bianca, but the girl was too head over heels for him. I felt so stupid for thinking I could live that fantasy of being Aaron's girl so easily. All this time, we all blindly put Aaron on a pedestal, while letting Liam be wrongly accused of all the things he never did. Through Liam, I found out that the Statics has been having a problem. Aaron wanted to leave the group because he thought they were a burden and he'd do better on his own, but the rest knew that it would break the fans' hearts if one of them left, so they've compromised by letting Aaron have a solo album while still staying with a group. Oh no, kick that jerk out now. As a representative of Ecstatic, I can assure you that we won't be sad if we know what an awful person he is. We'll show him the door. Glad to hear that. Now, about Bianca, do you know how to break this to her in the best way? It's hard, but ugly truth is the only way. So the next day, we went to see Bianca together, told her all about how much of a jerk Aaron is, all the girls he's been seeing, all the bad-mouthing about her, he said. Surprisingly, she took it better than we thought. Thank you, too, for looking out for me. I know, I know he's bad, but I thought I'd been able to change him. But yesterday, when he came throwing a fit at me, I realized that I deserved better. Oh, poor Bianca. I really owe her a zillion apologies. I asked Liam to give us a minute and came clean to her on everything. On the photo I posted, on how I intentionally got in between the relationship, on my dumb rules just to get the better of her. I'm truly sorry. I'm just a Tolulu fangirl after all. I'm really sad to hear that because at some point I did consider you a friend, especially your ridiculous roles. It helped me a lot. Look, you kept me on a strict diet, helped me get a healthy sleep schedule, made me practice more, stay off my phone, no more doom scrolling and obsessing over hateful comments. I can assure that you've helped me become a better artist and human overall, even though it's by accident. You are seriously too nice. How come I spent all these years hating on you? I'm sorry, and I don't think I should be around here anymore. I'd better go back to my normal life. Take care, Bianca. Bianca gave me a tight hug and said that she hoped I'd still come to her concert next week, as she'd perform the dance number we created together. Mm-hmm. Liam was nice enough to accompany me to Bianca's concert. I did ask Kyra if she wanted to come along, but she was all cranky. Bianca's concert? Are you an ecstatic anymore, Harper? She's our enemy. <laughs> kiddo. If only she could see past the hate. She could have met her Liam now. The show was going on smoothly. Bianca perfected our dance routine. I was so proud. But as she went to get ready for the next song, a strange VCR got played. I'm a selfish fanatic. A friend's betrayal. A gold digger. A Delulu. And on screen were pictures of me. No! Is this why Bianca insisted I come? Is this her paying back? Or is this Aaron's? Or Liam's? Suddenly, Bianca on the mic snapped me out of the panic attack. Uh, uh um. And I'm all the worst things without your love. Ladies and gentlemen, your favorite track for my second album, Here's Without You. Everyone cheered loudly, but a voice behind me took me aback. No, guys! That's not what the video's about! The lunatic is here! This one! Har- Oh my god! Liam! I- Liam quickly shushed her and we dragged her outside. Turned out my dearest sister from another mother did this to me. Why? I hate you. I know everything now. Don't forget who I am. Nothing in this fandom could be hidden from me. You got to befriend the boys but ghosted me because you want them all to yourself, huh? After everything we've been through, all the shows my mom helped you get in, you bewitched Aaron, sided with Bianca, then called my Liam a player. But look who you're with now. On top of that, you dumped my brother for a stupid reason. The player here is you. This is a mess, and it's really my fault. I should have filled Kyra in on everything sooner. Seeing her right now reminds me of the exact same person I was just last week. The same hot-headed, immature fan. I couldn't blame her. I apologized and told her everything. And with her dearest Liam's help, Kyra, though still mad, started to be more understanding. I love you, and I hope you will soon see things the way I do now. Idols are also humans. They're not all glitters and gold, so we can't expect them to be all perfect, then refuse to see their wrongdoings, or nitpicking trivial things just because it's not up to our expectations. Let's both be a better ecstatic from now, okay? 
It's been six months since then. I can say that things are definitely for the better now. It's the first performance of the Static since they parted ways with Aaron after his real face got exposed. Yes, that happened. Now look, it seems like the crowd has no problem with dumping that troublemaker either. And me? Normally I'd be here as an ecstatic, but not today. I'm now working part-time while studying to get proper certification on talent management. I realized that I did enjoy working with Bianca, and I actually had a knack for it, so I'm going to make a career out of it. Now, excuse me, guys. May I get my manager back? It's showtime. Bye!